just place this atmosphere over to you this evening. We say less of us and all of you. Father, Lord, we say you take total and absolute control. Let your name, your will, your plan, your purpose be made manifest. Lord, we just surrender ourselves to you tonight, oh God. And we say, Lord, we have got vessels in your hands. Vessels unto honor we will be in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, Lord, we just speak concerning everyone that will be joining tonight. We ask, oh God. But Lord, you will quicken their steps, and Lord, they will come on, and they will join, and they will receive from your throne room, O oh God. Father, we give you praise. We worship and we adore you. You are a good God, and there is none like you. Lord, we thank you because you share your glory with no man. Tonight, O oh God, we just create an atmosphere for you to do that only which you can do. Father, we bless you tonight. We lift up your name. We say, Daddy, you are welcome. You are welcome in this place at this time, at this hour. Father, we just surrender ourselves unto you, O God. Father, Lord, take all the glory, take all the dominion, take all authority, O God. Let your will, let your counsel, let your purpose only be made manifest tonight, O God. Father, we just worship you. We give you all the praise. We give you all the glory in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Mrs. Cook, good evening. Good evening. How are you? Good evening. Thank you so much. Just want to just lead us in a time of worship. Good evening, everybody. God bless you. Good to see you this evening. God bless you. Okay. Bless you. Thank you, Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of the earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace your eyes upon Jesus look full in his wonderful face and the things of the earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace in the light of his glory and grace hallelujah hallelujah you have won the victory hallelujah you have won it all for me death could not hold you down you
You are the risen King, hallelujah, hallelujah. You have won the victory, oh God, hallelujah. Death could not hold you down. You are the risen King. Seated in majesty. You are the risen King. You have won the victory. Hallelujah.
Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. Thank you for your presence in our lives. First and foremost, we want to thank you for the gift of life. Father, we worship you tonight. We have seen the seventh day of May of May. It's not by power. It's not by might. It's been by your spirit. Father, we just thank you. We sing and cry hallelujah unto you. It's the highest form of praise. We, 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 we return all to you in worship. Your faithfulness, your goodness, your loving kindness, your tender mercies over each and every one of us. Father, we are grateful. We thank you. For the end of another week, we are grateful. Father, Lord, receive our praise. Receive our thanks in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Good evening, church. May the Lord bless you all. I hope you've all had a, a, week, a great week. Thank you so much, Mrs. Kuku. May the Lord bless you. Um, so I'm just going to go quickly into the words this evening. I'm sure everybody got the text, and I really want to hope and pray that um, we have all studied. You know, like I said, this is a dispensation where we all need to study. We need to be Berean Christian. So we need to study, study to show ourselves approved. This is a time to do that like never before. You know, ignorance is not going to be an excuse anymore. The times we're living in now, it is only they that know their God that shall be strong and that will do exploits, you know, in the name of Jesus. In the market of life, none of us will be a spectator in the name of Jesus. So as we go on, I need us to obviously engage God like never before, engage the word like never before so that we will not be ashamed in the name of Jesus. May the Lord bless you. Holy Spirit, we thank you again. We turn this over to you. Have a free reign in this place tonight in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So I'm going to just begin very quickly from the book of Philippians, which you know that's what we're studying. So just a little bit of backdrop. This book was written by my Paul and Timothy, and this is when he was in prison. There are quite a few lessons um, in um, the book of Philippians, and I am really very excited to be sharing this. We're going to do chapter one this week, chapter two next week, and then we'll go from there. There's only four chapters in the book of Ephesians. So please, if you haven't, make sure you study. It's just a chapter a week. I don't think that's too much for any of us in this scene. So I begin. He says, this letter is from Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus. I am writing to all of God's people in Philippi who belong to Christ Jesus, including the church leaders and deacons. So every one of us is included in this. I want you to get that every single one of us, none left behind. He says, all of us, we're God's holy people who belong. So pastors, leaders, deacons, deacon show, can you hear your name there? <laughs> None of us are excluded. All of us are being spoken to. May God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Verse uh, three, two, 2 says, every time I think of you, I give thanks to God. Whenever I pray, I make my request for all of you with joy, for you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard of it until now. And I am certain that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. Can I just pause there very quickly? You know, a lot of the times this is a prayer that a lot of us pray. Ah, he who began the good work in me is able and faithful to bring me to a perfect completion. But if you read through the uh, verse two, he says, whenever I pray, I make requests of all of you because you have been partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you heard. So if you have not been spreading the good news, if you have not been spreading the good news about Christ, that's what he's saying, the God that started that work. So you have to check and examine yourself as we have been learning in church. Examine yourself. Have you been spreading the good news? Have you been spreading the good news? Because this is the work that God will finish and he will complete in you. But if we have, you know, it's not too late. We need to get going now. And the Lord will give us the grace to do so in Jesus. But he says he will not only continue, but he says he will finish it on the day when Christ Jesus returns. So please ensure that at this point in time from today, your work is good. You are doing the good and you're spreading the good news. You cannot have a good thing and hide it. You know, there are people amongst us here that people at work, people we work, we don't even know that we're Christians. This is the time to ensure that your life is really replicating Christ. You are living as a child of God and you are living Christ-like. Amen. That was just a question. So it is right that I should feel as I do about all of you, for you have 
You have a special place in my heart. You share with me the special favor of God, both in my imprisonment and in defending and confirming the truth of the good news. This is still about the good news. You know, I keep saying, please ensure, you know, that whatever you are doing, you are doing the <laughs> spreading the word of God, you know, and sometimes it's not even in your speech. Sometimes it's in your action. It's in who you are. You know, people see you and they say there is something about you in the way you make decisions, in the way you carry yourself, in your attitude with people, in your attitude at work. You know, some of us, our lifestyle does not even depict that of a Christian in any way. So please, I am begging you, this is the time for us to examine ourselves, you know, to ensure that really we are doing what we should be doing, that our life is lining up with the word of God, that the things that our actions and our thoughts and our deeds is lining up with what heaven is asking us to do. So he said, God knows how much I love you and long for you with the tender compassion of Jesus Christ. So I'm going to read that again. He says that verse eight, God knows how much I love you and long for you with the tender compassion of Jesus Christ. And this is where I am going. Verse nine says, I pray that your love would overflow more and more and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and in understanding. For I want you to understand what really matters so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. Verse 11, may you always be filled with the fruits of salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Christ Jesus. For this will bring much glory and praise to God. Amen. So the topic of my deliberation this evening, I want to assume that everybody has read everything, but I'm going to really own in on this verses 8 to 11. It's firing up the love of Christ in our hearts. It says firing up the love of Christ in our hearts. You know that verse, verse 9, it says, I pray that your love will overflow more and more and that you will keep growing, you know. And so this is a powerful scripture. You know, and it's a powerful position. It's a powerful portion of scripture that we're going to explore this evening. You know, and I pray that the Holy Spirit will give in depth and give light and clarity to every one of us in Jesus' name. So um, according to scripture, book of First John, First John verse 4, chapter 4, 7 to 8. It says, so First John chapter 4, verse 7 to 8. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God. The Bible tells us here, for God is love. So God is love. We're still on that same thing because we're talking about really our love. We're trying to ignite and fire up the love of Christ in our hearts. So it says that we should. God is love. So you cannot say you love God. If obviously you don't love, you cannot say, oh, I love God. And yes, everybody around you, you don't love. The Bible says another scripture. It says, uh, John 13, 35. It says, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Another version says, by this shall men know that you are my disciples when you love one another. You know, so you are disciples of God. It is a true, if I want to know whether you're a disciple of God or whether you're a child of God, you must be able to love one another. You must see your brother and love them and encourage them. I don't want to see hatred. That's what he's saying here. Hence, those who operate in love, they end up seeing the manifestation of God. I'm just reading a few scriptures so that I'm trying to build a backdrop to this. So John 14, 2 says, those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. I didn't say this about it. Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my father will love them. And I will love them and reveal myself to each one of them. So God is saying to us here, you know, we first said, we know that God is love. We know that by this shall men know that you are my disciples. Then the third one is saying, God will manifest and reveal himself to those who love him, who obey his commandments. Those are the people he will manifest himself to. So the love of God at work in the life of any individual opportunes you to experience a manifestation of God, of, of God on your behalf. You see God show up on your behalf if you love God. 
we're still on the same Philippians because I need us where the topic is firing up the love of Christ in our hearts. You know, Paul is said a prayer here that, that we need to love him more and more. Your so love is a virtue. As we all know, love is a virtue that has the ability to either wax cold, diminish or increase. This same love of God that we're talking about, by which people will know that you're his disciples and this same love that God is. And this same love that would ensure the manifestation of God on your behalf, you know? And so as individuals, we have the possibility for that love to either increase or to diminish. If you look at Matthew 24, 12, it says, sin is rampant everywhere, but it says the love of many will wax cold. The love of many will wax cold. So there is a diminishing dimension to this love. So it is possible for this love, one way or another, to diminish or to grow. And it also says in the book of Ephesians 4.15, instead we will speak the truth in love, growing everywhere more and more like Christ, who is the head of the church. So if you're with me, he said, there is a way the love can grow and there's a way the love can diminish. So today I really want to talk about how do we stay on the right side of that equation? How do we as children of God are on the right side of that equation where really our love for God will not diminish, that our love for God will not wax cold, that our love for God will only increase more and more like Paul has prayed. And this is where a lot of us falter. How do we grow in our love and passion for God? The heart and passion that you have for God determines the height that you scale in life. The love, the heart, and the passion that you have for God determines to a very large extent, you know, where, how you scale, where you, where you your, your scale in life. And God is looking for men and women who are after him passionately who are going after him. If you remember in the book of 1 Samuel, you know, when Saul had sinned against God and God had to say to Samuel, I have found another man after my heart. You know, may God not be angry at us in the name of Jesus. So there is a way where the love, you know, where sin cannot dominate you, but your love for God will go, will continue to increase more and more so that we will be pleasing to him in every area of our lives. God is always seeking for people whose heart continuously burns after him. So there is a desire by every one of us to be used by God. A lot of us have a desire, God, please, you know, I need to be a vessel in your hands. God, I need you to do this for me. Our heart is so central to all that happens around us. If you're going to take leaps and bounds, if you're going to have experiences or adventures with God, you need to ensure that your heart is right with God. You need to ensure that your heart, you love God more than ever before. This helps us to maximize, you know, our adventure in life. It helps us to be able to move closer to him. So how can we make sure that our love keeps growing? How can we be effective instruments in God's hands? And that's what I want to find out today. And I'm asking you and I, and we need to examine ourselves. Some of us got born again years and years ago, you know, and life has happened. And unfortunately, fortunately, unfortunately, the love, our love for God has waxed cold. But at this junction, I need us to ask ourselves, where am I at? Is my heart burning for God? Is my heart burning for Christ? Am I yearning after him like I should? Have I fallen short of where I was at the beginning? Am I doing what I should be doing? This is what Paul is asking us, that our love must grow more and more. You know, it is clear that our love must grow on the basis of two things. If you look at that scripture that I read, it says in knowledge and in understanding. In knowledge and in understanding. In knowledge and in sound judgment. You know, actually, let me read that same scripture for us in the Amplified Version. In the Amplified Version, it says, verse 9, Philippians 1, 9. And this I pray, that your love may abound more and more, displaying itself in greater depth, in real knowledge and in practical insight, so that you may learn to recognize and treasure what is excellent, identifying the best and distinguishing moral differences, that you may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ 
actually living lives that lead others away from sin, filled with the fruits of righteousness, which, which comes from Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of our God. So his glory may both be revealed and recognized. That's that same version in Amplified. So how do we start to love God? How do we ensure, you know, because there are two dimensions to here, you know, it's in knowledge and in understanding. And so the first thing is you cannot love God unless you know him. You cannot love God. The degree to which you know God, the degree to which your knowledge of God is, it is the degree to which you will love him. You cannot love who you do not know. The Bible says, you know, the, the, in Romans 5.5, 5, the love of God has been shared abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit puts a seed there, but it is down to knowledge for it to grow more and more. It is down to knowledge for it to grow more and more. You know, um, there's another scripture that I want to read very quickly. I'm reading a few scriptures. Philippians chapter three, this same book of Philippians. And go to verse, verse seven, Philippians chapter three. I once thought, verse seven, I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Jesus Christ as my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counted it all garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count my own righteousness to obey the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way is making us right with himself depends on faith. So, Paul was saying here, there were some things that you don't need to matter to me. There are some things that I used to, you know, they were my yardstick to success. There were some things that I used to paint that I thought, you know, this had value. But he's saying right now, the things that were valuable to me in the past, I have counted them as worthless. Because right now, I am clinging on to Christ. For really, for knowing God, I am discarding those things. How many of us are still holding on to things? How many of us have things standing in the way of our knowledge and growing deeper in love with God? For some of us, it's career. For some of us, it's, you know, uh, family. For some of you know, we just have a lot of things that keep clouding us. And really, as a stumbling block before us. And those things we hold on to. But Paul is saying here, those things I count as worthless. You know, for every one of us here, COVID has taught us a lesson. There were things that we assumed were so important that COVID has taught us, you don't need them. Those things should not take priority in your life. We must get to a level where knowing God has to be the primary focus of our race. Engaging God must be really the end and be all. Knowing who he is, being, you know, having an intimate relationship with him should be the driving force of our lives. Our loyalty must just be to God. We must grow to love him deeper. The more knowledge, the more the knowledge of God we have, the more we are enraptured in his love. The Bible says in Matthew 6, 33, we know it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all its righteousness, and he will give you everything you need. We're still talking about the book of Philippians. God wants, he wants to be number one on your priority list. He wants to take priority. God's expectation is that everything that pertains to him, pertains to his kingdom, must be on the forefront of our hearts. He wants our hearts to be ignited with that. It's not going to just happen on the whim. A lot of times we think, well, it's just automatic. No, it takes you walking, digging more into him, finding out a bit more about him, going into his word. But majority of us have lost that. And we have become, some people, it's just Sundays we even open those Bibles. And we think we are drawing closer to God. And that's why, honestly, some of us are not seeing the hand of God in our lives. Because God is he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is not, he is no respecter of anybody. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all of its righteousness. 
every other thing will be added on. It has got to be ingrained in our hearts. We as humans are attached to so many things. For some people, it's just my family. For some people, it's status. Ah, you know, until I get married, I have to get married. And you know, you forget everything. Forgetting that God is the be all and the end all of everything. One word from God, one word from God, in fact, eradicates 10 years of labor, of sweat, of efforts that you don't need. Because he just says, no, this is the way to go. This is where you do. He would order and orchestrate your footsteps. But you've got to make him priority. Give him center stage. Put him on the driving seat of your life. How many of us have put Christ on the driving seat of our lives? Or we're yanking it away from him? Amen. May the Lord help us. Everything Paul is saying here is really nothing and nonsense compared to, you know, knowing Christ. He becomes the center of my focus. People say, I want to be used by God. I want a deeper walk with him. But you cannot love God, even if the people around you, you find it very difficult to love. There must, we cannot be attached to those things. We cannot be attached to those things. So we must know that. So we must know God. So I'm going to talk about knowledge. The first thing, knowledge is what keeps everything together in check. Let me go to that Philippians 3, 7, and I read the Amplified. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared to the infinite value of knowing God. Showing the same value of knowing God. Once you know him, it's not a problem loving him. Once you know him, you don't, and once you love him, you don't struggle with sin. It's difficult to say, God, I love you. I know you. And then you know, you're contending with, do I need to, and pastor was saying, I think one day, do I need to drink? I, am I allowed to drink? Should I drink? Should I go to party? Should I fornicate? Should I commit adultery? It is because you do not know God. It is because you do not love him. When you love him like you should, those things drop off. It becomes second nature for you to be more like him because you're spending time with him. He must be the focus of our adventure. Hebrews 1, Hebrews 12, 1 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witness, let us strip off every weight that slows us down. Especially the sin that so easily trips us and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. You and I have a race to run. You and I are sojourning on the face of this earth. There comes a time where we need to finish. We are writing an exam. It will be pent up at some point in time. What are you writing for yourself? How are you writing it? God must be the epicenter. He must be the focus of your adventure. Complete center of your focus from start to finish. In Matthew, th Matthew 13, 44 says, the kingdom of God is like a man who found a treasure. You know, kingdom of God is like a man who found it and he sold everything he had. Are we selling? Are we, are we able to forego those things for the joy of knowing Christ? For the joy of really loving Christ? Or are we still holding on to the baggage of the past? The pleasures of sin? The pleasures of this world? The things that are keeping us down? We need to examine ourselves. He says he found a treasure. What he found was everything. Many have understood the value. Many don't understand the value of what we have in Christ. In fact, Paul says it is of supreme advantage. Paul, he paints a powerful picture. It, he, says, he says it is a priceless privilege. That's what the Amplifier says. Priceless privilege. It's of supreme, and it's a joy that is unequaled. These are all the things Paul used to qualify knowing Christ. So you need to come to a deeper knowledge. I and mean, you know, like I said earlier, we're not talking about salvation. I mean, I can remember when I got saved, in fact, you couldn't stop me. Anybody, even the cat and the dog at home knew I was saved. Because I was ready to preach Christ to everybody. I just couldn't hide it. You know, and by that, once I get, please, let's pray. Let's pray. Everywhere I went, I was on campus. Let's pray. Let's, you know, it was just about God. And I pray that every one of us will go back to that way, where the zeal 
of God will consume us yet again. That our love for God will not wax cold. Life happens to every one of us. But really, it's your knowledge of God that makes the difference. So we need at this point in time to examine our journey. Like I said earlier, in the market of life, none of us will be spectators in Jesus' name. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will reveal this to every one of us in a greater and a higher dimension in the name of Jesus. We all of us will have personal experiences with God, personal adventure. God's expectation of us is that he needs us to have a personal adventure with him, interaction with him. Not just from what somebody said or just reading from hearsay. But we need to, our affection for him, you know, a lot of the times our affection for God is tied to what he can do. It's tied to, you know, not who he is, but for what he can, for his performance. You hear people say, oh yes, but you know, I, 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 if, oh God, if you do this for me, this is what I will do. If I can do this, this is what I will No. We tie our love for God to based on his performance. No. The person first. The person first. And this is what Paul is saying to us, that our love will grow more and more, not because this is what he can do, not the benefits of him, but who is he to you? God does, you know, this is an example when you think, obviously, you know, and God sees all that. God sees the heart. He knows. So it's like a young man who obviously has a lot of money, and then there's a young girl that says, oh, you know, I want to get married to you. And obviously, I want to get married to you because you have money. You know, people are that selfish. It's all about what we can get or what God can do for me. That's where the stage where a lot of people are at right now. But Paul is saying, no, I count all those things as useless. Because the Bible has said, I should seek first the kingdom of God and righteousness first, and everything else will be added unto me. I pray that knowing him, you know, to know him, knowing him is what we should do. Loving him comes as a result of that. When you know him, you know, knowing him, you must learn to know him. Loving him is an experience. It's what happens as a result of your knowing him. It's a chain reaction. We deepen our knowledge of him in order to heat up our love for him. When you know God, when he reveals himself to you, when you crave to deepen your knowledge of him, we must be consumed by the person of Christ and not the promise. So I beg you today, by the mercies of God, by the Holy Spirit, we'd all go back and say, God, you know, because I'm talking about knowledge, I'm talking about knowing Christ. We must know Christ. We must know him. That's the first thing that we must do. Knowledge is the first thing. The second thing, we must see him from his word. We must see him from his word. I'm talking about how do I ensure that I am fired up, that my love for God is fired up? Because this is what we have to do. This is really at the center of our focus. So see him from his word. The word is designed as a window into Christ, into who Christ is. The word of God is a window into who, the word reveals God to you and I. We must approach the word. Look, the devil, the devil's major aim is to block our access. The devil wants us to look, but doesn't want us to see. That will not be our portion in the name of Jesus. The word is meant to reveal Christ to us. So I pray every time I, I look in the word, I say, God, I want to see Jesus in the word. I want to see Jesus in the word. The Bible says in John 5, 9, it says, you search the scriptures because you think they give eternal life. But the scriptures point to me. That's what Christ is saying. The scriptures is a window into who Christ is. And as we get to a level where to know him, you need to see him in the word. The word tells you everything about him. The word teaches you about him. The word reveals him to you. And so we must. The scripture is, is central responsibility is to testify of Christ. Every portion of scripture from Genesis to Revelation points to Christ. And so if you say you do not know him, it's because you're not a student of the word. And so I pray. And I must see him. You must have a face-to-face -face encounter with him. The Bible says in Psalm 119 verse 18, open my eyes to see that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. They're wonderful things. God's expectation is that we would go into his word 
to see. Don't be satisfied with just reading the Bible. We must be seeing. Open my eyes to see. That must be your prayer. Open my eyes to see. The devil wants to keep us reading but not studying. But we must get past the point of reading and get to the point of actually seeing. And this is vital for every Christian person, for every believer. Because it is what you know, the truth you know, that will set you free. The Bible says in Ephesians 1, this is, you know, what I've started doing, I've started to look at all the prayers of Paul. And it's amazing because obviously this way of us, there are prayers that every individual, if we can hold on to these prayers and pray them regularly, you will see a change in your life. And Paul, that's what he was asking in Ephesians 1. We did it quite a few weeks ago. Asking God the glorious Father, Ephesians 1, 17 to 18. Asking God the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ to give you spiritual wisdom and insight that you may grow in your knowledge of God. I pray that your heart will be flooded with light so you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called, his holy people, and his rich in glorious inheritance. God wants us to see. This is the key. I pray that every single time, every one of us go into the world, we want to say, I want to see Jesus. I want to see Jesus. And the more you hunger and thirst after that, the more you learn and learn from the word, the more the Holy Spirit floods your heart with light, the more you have illumination, the more you have direction, the more you know what you need to do. And I pray that every one of us will be able to do this. Anything that really would stand as a barrier between yourself and the word, between yourself and seeing Jesus should not be tolerated. We should get to a point where we say, look, no, prioritize it. It must be my principal focus. And when I see him, I must see him. I must be able to look at him. I must be able to experience him. Then I am not struggling with sin. I am not struggling with fornication. I'm not struggling with things that I shouldn't be struggling with. Because, you know, God captivates my heart and my everything. I am saying it to every one of us today. We need to. So you see, we are talking about knowing Christ. So the first thing is you need to see God in his word. Number two, communion in prayer. Communion in prayer. Altar of prayer is a place of intimate interaction. You get to know people. You know, a lot of the times you get to know people, you observe them, I see. But when you converse with them, you get to know them more. A lot of us just stand there knowing enough about God, but we don't converse with him. When at your prayer altar, there is a spiritual exchange. There is a spiritual exchange. You're exchanging your inadequacies, your insufficiencies. You're getting more of him. That's what happens in the place of prayer. So you can be attracted to God by just observing him. People are telling you about him, but you only get to know him when you converse with him. That intimate time, that separation time, that time you go to him in prayer. The Bible says in that Philippians 3 verse 10, it says, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. There is a mighty power that all of us yet are yet to experience. And that happens in the place of prayer. It's our passion to interact with him. Paul always, every single time Paul had, you know, he was talking about people, he would put a prayer forward. He would go and pray, God, let your light flood their lives. You know, just let them grow more and more. And so I want to pray, let their eyes of understanding be enlightened. And I want to say that in the place of prayer, we must, there must be an exchange. Look at the life of Moses. Moses prayed like never before. You know, let God's glory find expression in you. Moses spent so much time even on the mountain that by the time he came out, the Bible says even the glory of the Lord was seen upon him. There is an impartation that is waiting to take place. There is a spiritual exchange that is waiting to take place in the place of prayer. The Bible says in Luke 9, 29, about eight days later, Jesus took Peter, John, and James on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was transformed. And his clothes became glistening white. There is an exchange that takes place in the place of prayer. When you and I can go to God in prayer, in conversation, 
You know, a lot of the times we come and not just a come and a desire and a demand every time. God, I want. God, I need. God, I must. God, I, you know, our prayer points must change. You know, one of the longest standing prayer that I pray is that prayer that I may know him. Philippians 3 verse 8 to 10. That I may know him. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. It's one of, you know, and it's a great prayer. It's a desire. It's the greatest desire of any child of God that we may. So our prayer must change. No, God, can, can I have, uh, you know, please we'll do this, do that. God is saying, hold on, you know. And so our prayer must change. A lot of times we go to God, it is with a need. We have our list already. God, here. One, two, I must get my, my children, my home, my marriage, my husband, my you know, and there must be a time as mature Christians, pastor shared about maturity, where all those things are, you know, okay, God, I want to know you more. I desire to know you. There were certain things when you start to look at the Psalms and the life and the life of David, you realize that how easily God has said, this is a man after my heart, despite his frailties. And I pray that you will take our personal time with God very seriously. And that will give you an insight into the person of God in the name of Jesus. None of us will be left behind. We will not waste our time. We will go to God in prayer. First, you will do is spend time in the word. Second is really commune with him in prayer. We are talking about getting to know him, the knowledge of God. Number three is worship. Worship creates an atmosphere of God. Worship deepens your access to the insights of God. Worship deepens your access. You know, in the place of worship, you hear, you know, let me, Exodus 19, 17, I'm going to read it very quickly. It says, on the morning of the third day, thunder rolled and lightning flashed, and a dense cloud came down upon the mountain. There was a long, loud blast from a ram's horn, and all the people trembled. You know, basically, you know, the loud horn is a, it's an instrument of worship, but God came down. God came down. You know, God comes down in the midst of praise and worship. When you're worshiping God, heartfelt worship, heartfelt worship, heaven comes to attention. The Bible says in the book of Acts chapter 13, I'm not going to read everything. The Bible says, appoint Barabbas to verse 3. So after more fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands on him. So more further, um, verse 2, Acts 13, verse 2. One day, as these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, so during worship, the Holy Spirit said. So I want to speak to you and I. Our time of worship is very sacred. When we're worshiping, I don't, it doesn't matter what key the leader is on. I tune to the frequency of heaven. We sing to the key of heaven. And this is in worship. We're talking about our love for him growing more and more. We tune into the frequency of heaven in worship. God is waiting. It says, as they were worshiping and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, the Holy Spirit is waiting to speak to you and I. And I pray that we engage him in the name of Jesus. Once you engage him in worship, you pick a direction and you move. And he tells you what to go. The worship deepens your access to God. And that will be the same. The Bible says in John 4, 22, uh, 23 to 24 you know the but the time isn't coming and indeed it is now when god is seeking true worshipers to worship him in spirit and in truth we are talking about knowing god more very quickly because of time meditation i won't go too much into meditation you know the more of god that you meditate on um psalm 63 6 to 8 just uh, without reading that scripture the description of past Take time to intentionally focus on God. Reflect on his love. Reflect on his love. Reflect on his mercy. Reflect on his goodness. Remembering who he is, what you learned about him. Keeping your mind on him will increase your knowledge of him. Thereby you grow in love. Your love for him will be difficult to compromise. Your heart, your mind must be filled with God on a daily basis. You think about his goodness. You think about what he has done. You think about obviously, you know, so we must ensure meditation. So I've talked about five things that we must remember. Four, actually. Talked about the word. 
talk about communion in prayer, we talked about worship, we talked about meditation. We talked about ways that we need to ensure that we fire up the love of God in our hearts. So that was just talking about knowledge. The second dimension when we talk about how our love will grow is by understanding. We must get that by understanding. Colossians 1.9 says, so we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. When you understand God's ways, my brother, my sister, when you understand God's ways, you know, you will love him. If you don't understand his ways, you become frustrated. So let us come to a level where we know we are driven to a place of discovery of God. We discover who he is. We must have a God's perspective on every matter. Your life should seek to understand him. I spoke about Moses earlier. You know, the Bible says in Psalm 103, 7 to 8, the Bible says he revealed his character to Moses and his deeds to the people of Israel. Moses sought the way of God. Moses sought to understand God. And that is why for the 40 years they were in the wilderness, not one time did he relent and go back. Everybody else had opportunity. They would cry one time. They would decide one time. But Moses never did because he had sought to understand God. The children of Israel, they knew of his acts. They knew what he did. He fed them this from heaven. He did this. He parted the Red Sea. But they never understood him. It must be our life's ambition, life's drive to understand Christ. To understand. Moses never once turned back. He never once said, oh, I, I'm, I'm going to go back. You know, for the 40 years, Moses would ask God, show me your ways. Let me understand you. So how do I, you must, how, you, you must just, you know, there must be a, a way that we crave to understand God. We cannot say we love this person. The one that, you know, is a giver of life. is the one that formed you. He created you, you know, and so we must get to know him. We must get to love him. We must get to understand him. So I charge on every single one of us tonight. And then you may say to me, oh, but you know, I'm not quite sure. How do I get, how do I get to understand him? How do I get to understand God? So the first thing as well is study the word. I'm not that, study the word. The word of God, the word of God, the word of God, the word of God. It gives you a window to who Christ is. We must ensure the word of God shows you the way of God. We must be students of the word. We cannot go away from that. We must be students. So the Bible says in 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show yourself approved. We're not talking about reading here. We're talking about studying the word. That's how you get to understand him. The word is a window to who God is. Secondly, we engage prayer. Still the same thing. Be consciously, continuously passionate about God. Be continuously passionate about God. We must do. Because if you're not passionate about him, you can't get to know him. Your fire and intensity must develop one way or another. And when you're in a place of prayer, the Bible says Exodus 33, 3, that's where Moses said, God, show me your ways. Moses went to God in prayer. Number three, you engage teachers. Listen, if you're a child of God and you feel you know it all, I know the Holy Spirit is the greatest teacher. But then you must engage teachers. That's why you have pastors, you have, you know, evangelists. You, have, you must engage teachers. You must be a believer that goes to church fellowship. You know, you learn, you grow. You get understanding. There are people that listen to me. There are people I listen to. So as a child of God, you will become stagnant if you're not growing. If you lack understanding, you're not going anywhere. If all you come to do is just take, 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 that relationship is bankrupt in the first place. We must get to a level where you have teachers that you're listening to. And like I said, the Holy Spirit is the ultimate teacher. I go back to the word. Even if I've heard somebody say something, if I've heard a man of God, a woman of God say anything, I go back and I meditate like a Berean Christian. How many of us are doing that? That is how you understand. If we cannot do that, we are not going anywhere. Please, I beg you, this is a, you know, your pursuit for God has to be evident. It is the difference maker. We must seek to understand who Christ is. 
And when you understand, you know him, you understand him, loving him comes naturally. You know, when you talk about, obviously, uh, uh, but you know, but how, this, uh, why don't, would I not love my family if I'm talking about God? Once you love God, once the love of God is in your heart, he finds his natural expression in you loving the people around you. You don't struggle with loving your husband or your wife when you love God. Your husband or wife does not love you because you're beautiful, because there would always be somebody else who is more beautiful. You want, we can't keep a home because you can cook the best, because there would always be a better chef out there. It is the fear of God that keeps. And it's when you love God, you fear him, you obey his commandments, you do his bidding. So I'm charging us tonight, every single one of us, to get understanding, to get a knowledge of God, you get understanding. If you look very quickly, let me go back to my original text. Um, wow, 25, Philippians chapter one. You know, very quickly, just to verse nine. So it says, also another thing is you must love others. You know, Paul was saying here in that verse seven, he says, God knows how much I love you and long for you with the tender compassion of Christ. When you understand God, loving others is not a problem. When you, under, when you love God and you understand him and you know him, loving others, Paul is saying here that loving you, I'm loving you the way Christ loved me, with the same kind of compassionate love that Christ had, the tender compassion, I love you the same way. How many of us can say that? So those are the things that we need to do. Number, let me go back quickly. There's another thing that here for I want you to understand. Also, it brings about discernment and direction. He says in verse 10, for I want you to understand what really matters so you may live pure and blameless lives. There's discernment. There's direction. Those things are amplified. When you love God, when you know him and you understand him, your direction is amplified. There's clarity. He says here that you may know there is a clear cut distinction between you and anybody else. And he says here, lastly, 11, that you may be filled with the fruit of salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Christ Jesus. Fruit of righteousness is a result of your love for God. The fruit of righteousness is as a result of your love for God. You cannot exhibit any fruit of righteousness without loving God. Every fruit of righteousness comes out of your love for God. Our acquaintance with God brings forth this manifestation. So, and you can't love God genuinely without knowing him. And you cannot know him without understanding him, without understanding his ways. So once all these things are in place, the seed is sown. And once the seed is sown, it must germinate. Then you exhibit the fruits of righteousness, which is pleasing to God. The Bible says, for this will bring much glory and praise to God. Every single one of us wants to bring glory and praise to God. We want our lives, we want our worship, we want everything. We don't want to be one that God will say, look, no, I have nothing to do with you. We want to be vessels fit for his use, you know? And so we must seek to love him. But to love him more and more, we need to know him. And to know him, we must understand his ways. Every child of God. So this does not only bring about you know, um, all those things, but also it gives you discernment and direction. And the fruit of righteousness is what you exhibit. And ultimately your life pleases God. So I charge every one of us tonight, enough of a time where we're just playing church. Enough of a time where our time does not, you know, there's no priority. God is not taking center stage. Enough of the times where we're not really doing, going about our father's business. All those things that we run after, they are there. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all of its righteousness. Every other thing will follow. Some of us are laboring and may we not labor in vain. But God is saying, I did not even send you that. But we have not been able to commune with him. We don't have that intimate experience with him. So you wouldn't know whether our ladder is living on the wrong wall or not. Or you are running another man's race. And I charge every one of us. 
more and more and more. This is what Paul is admonishing every one of us. That our love will grow more and more, but your love cannot grow more and more unless you love, unless you know him. So every time you pick up the word of God, I want to see Jesus. From Genesis to Revelation, I want to see Jesus. I want to see Jesus. I do not want to be content with just reading the word. I want to study. I want to see Jesus. And that will be your portion in the name of Jesus. That will be your experience in the name of Jesus. God's expectation of you and I is to have adventures with him, is to, you know, fellowship with him, is to have an intimate relationship with him. But and I pray that obviously we will not just go through life and just coast through life and just pass through life. I was saying to somebody, so you don't want to get to heaven and God is showing you, this is what I had for you. This is what I had for you. And you did not even accomplish a, a, a tenth of it. That will not be our portion in the name of Jesus. But when we get to know him, he speaks to us. You know, when I was talking about um, you need teachers, the Bible says in the book of Isaiah 30, you know, you will hear what's behind you. Please, let's go there very quickly actually before I go. Just one last scripture. One last scripture. Isaiah verse 30. Um, because a lot of the times we think, oh, the teachers are just there and we don't need anything. Verse 30, I think it's verse 20. He says, oh, sorry, I'm not there. He says, though the Lord gave you adversity for food, and no, no, it's not there. Okay, so that's it. You will see your teacher with your own eyes. Right behind you, you will hear a voice saying, this is the way to go. You know, you're walking with God. He will speak to you. He will direct you. You will hear his word, his voice clearly because you have spent time with him. You will know who he is to you. So when he says this is what you should do, you will walk in it. And so you would prevent yourself from years and years of toiling in vain. Because he has a specific word for you and I at every point in time. So I pray by the grace of God that every one of us will tap into this grace and start to experience God in a greater and a higher dimension. That none of us will labor in vain. We will not be spectators in our race in life. We will fulfill purpose. We will fulfill destiny. Every single thing God has in store for us, we would accomplish in the mighty name of Jesus. We will seek to love him. We will seek to know him. We will seek to understand his ways like Moses did. We will never look back to perdition in the name of Jesus. Everything that God says to us, we will do. To love him is to obey him and do his bidding and do his commandments. And that shall be our portion in the name of Jesus. The glory of God will find expression in your lives in the name of Jesus. Heaven will smile at you every single waking moment in Jesus' mighty name. Please ensure that your prayer time, you guard it jealously. Your prayer time is a time. In fact, recently now you hear a lot of people, Bill Gates and Melinda Gates, have, uh, they, are, they are divorced. Some people know every single thing about the divorce. Do you know enough about God? In fact, Kim Kardashian, they can tell you the color of her kitchen sink. Do you know enough about God? I want to charge every one of us. Let's not just be looking at these so-called celebrities. Let us find out, you know, what is on the heart of God concerning us, concerning everything that concerns us. Let's seek to know him, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. That should be our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Uh, please, we put the number just as you know what to do. You know, God loves a cheerful giver. It's not by compulsion, you know, but obviously we know what we do as a church. Um, we obviously cater for the needy. We cater for the orphans in Nigeria, in South Africa, in Zimbabwe. You know, so every single seed that you sow into this house, we pray that, Lord, it will be multiplied to you a hundredfold in the name of Jesus. God is not a debtor to any man. When you give to God, you know, you when you give to the poor, you lend unto the Lord, and God will reward you exceedingly in the name of Jesus. So please go back tonight. Um, the, phone, the phone number was on there. So please, if you can't, ping it is ending. So you won't be able to do bank transfer or use the phone numbers. Um, and God will bless you and multiply your seed in the name of Jesus. Next week, we'll be here again, studying the book of Philippians chapter two. But please, before then, go back to the book of you know, Philippians chapter one, study and study and study again. God bless you. God keep you. God perfect all that concerns you and grant you peace in every area in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.